Ooh. Happy uh -oh. birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Liana. Happy birthday to you. Thank you so much. I think we touched that. Uh, this is what we mean when we say that the shipping community is a community of fellows, peers, and friends. Thank you so much, Adonis, Violaris, and uh, all of you. Would you buy the torta? And on this point, I would like to kindly ask uh, Mr. Uh, Ilias, uh, Costa, uh, Professor uh, George Vangelas to sit next to me. And uh, next to Professor Vangelas, uh, we will have Mr. Ilias Costandinu from uh, Achionacti Navigation. And uh, would you be so kind, uh, Theodore uh, Julliaras of uh, Up Oil Trading, uh, to sit next to Elias? And next to Elias, we are having uh, Danai Bezantaku, CEO of uh, Navigator Shipping Consultant Limited, and Dr. Maria Progulaki, academic and industry expert. I forgot perhaps to mention capacity of uh, Elias, but it was mentioned before, Chief Operating Officer, Kionak T. So... Before you begin, before you begin, may I, Dr. Christodoulou, put on uh, the hat of the journalists, which uh, I have had uh, for more than 20 years, and ask you, as we have a cross-professional audience in the room, it would be useful to first understand the general context where maritime supply chains come into play. So, can you put maritime supply chains into perspective? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, since we are on stage, and I think we are all happy to be on stage, and all things being equal, um, if maritime supply chains were a play, they would clearly be a super show not only because they involve so many organizations, processes, people, networks, uh, information, but also because they can accommodate all the trends, <coughs> sustainability, resilience, um, internet of things, artificial intelligence, automization, autonomy, uh, we all understand that each component of maritime supply chains has a role to play in the cargo flow. And as such, they give rise to risks and challenges. To name but a few, one may think of congestions, delays, epidemics, limited insights into available capacity, environmental concerns, regulatory issues, penalties, the risk of non being compliant, the risk of being sanctioned, so many aspects uh, which uh, need to be taken care of. The industry is taking care of uh, many important aspects of this huge uh, playground by adopting or considering cleaner technologies, by considering uh, sustainable practices, by trying to improve uh, certain things. This happens under the vigilant eye of the legislator and enforcement authorities. You may be aware of recent developments concerning uh, the FAL Convention the IMO Convention on Facilitation of Traffic, where we have, and this is a, a legal uh, constraint, the obligation for states and maritime authorities to make sure that ports and ships um, are operational, 
despite uh, possible uh, health uh, emergencies, public health emergencies of international concern. They need to make sure that ports and ships are oper operational despite such emergencies. And also, under the umbrella of uh, FAL Convention, we have a maritime single window about the mandatory exchange of data concerning ships, uh, which is also an aspect of interest to EU law. So all in all, uh, maritime supply chains embraced a vast uh, uh, range of uh, highly relevant and current topics, and we are here to explore within time constraints, uh, uh, we don't have unlimited time at our disposal, some key aspects of this important topic. And uh, without any delay, I would like to address um, the first question to uh, Professor Vangelas uh, concerning the vulnerabilities of ships and the shipping industry at present. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, let's talk about vulnerability in shipping. Uh, may I say that we can spot two issues here. I mean, the first one, uh, which is a more general, although it's the cyber security. I mean, we had a lot of uh, cyber security incidents in the past. We had the case of Mars, of Costco, and many other companies, which is, this is a vulnerable thing for the shipping industry. Um, but let me put it on another perspective. Instead of talking about vulnerability, Let's talk about uncertainty, which is more or less part of the vulnerability issue. And uh, talking about uncertainty, what we are facing right now with what, which issues uh, shipping is uh, dealing with, we have the geopolitical turmoils we see uh, around the world, what's going on. And of course, we have another issue that is, uh, let's say, um, of uh, significance for, 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 for shipping, which is the fuels. I mean, the last more or less six to seven years, we'll keep discussing about fuels, what's going on with the alternative fuels of shipping. Uh, we have new regulations from the European Union. We have the Green Deal. We have the Fit for 55. What shipping will, has to do in order to, to, to deal with uh, these new regulations? And so far, after seven or six, six to seven years of discussions, we are still in point zero. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't know actually what's going on in uh, what will go on shipping in the next five years regarding fuel. We are discussing about ammonia. We are discussing about LNG. Uh, hydrogen has been put in the, in the discussion the last few years, even nuclear energy. But actually, ask any ship owner you want right now. And the question is, let's assume that you are going to build some vessels in the next two or three years. Which will be the fuel that you are going to select? I don't know. So this, I think, is most, the most vulnerable uh, issue for shipping, because you have to invest something. You have to, to invest a lot of money for, um, um, for a ship that's going to last for 20, 25 years. And right now, you don't know exactly the specifications that this vessel has to meet or to, to adapt. So more or less, this is the... There is uh, a lot of uncertainty concerning alternative fuels. And um, we see a number of studies uh, from the industry and from uh, key organizations trying to shed light on the uh, choices of uh, ship owners and other investors. Now, this brings me to the uh, next question uh, that I would like to address to Elias Costandino and uh, Theodore Huyaraz. I would like to ask you, please, what investments are needed by ships in the frame of ESG and uh, regulatory constraints, in your opinion? Elias. Well, um, ships, like any other industry, are uh, increasingly under pressure to align to environmental and social uh, governments, uh, to criteria and regulatory constraints. Uh, so, um, basically, like uh, Dr. Aguilar said, uh, there is a, uh, a concern about uh, the fuel efficiency and what type of ships uh, we should uh, build. And uh, I think, but uh, that being said, um, there are companies and there are uh, shipping uh, ship owners that are investing uh, in uh, 
alternative uh, fuels and uh, building ships that, uh, with, for, that use LNG or other biofuels. Of course, investing uh, also in, um, in other types of uh, emission control systems, renewable energy systems, ballast water, this is something uh, that is ongoing now, and waste management things. Of course, uh, other types of uh, investments um, that I would say uh, the ship or ship owners uh, are investing in, and uh, we heard about uh, this uh, earlier this morning, is implementing advanced monitoring and uh, reporting systems so they can help uh, ships track their environmental performance, which is very important, and ensure compliance with uh, regulatory requirements. Of course, quite important is also crew training and uh, the welfare, investing in crew training and ensuring proper welfare uh, for the facilities on board and enhancing and uh, social responsibility. Um, also, consideration to environmental risk and uh, liability should be factored into the insurance uh, risk management strategies and uh, included in the coverage of potential pollution incidents, as you can see. Uh, I would say that um, investments in ESG initiatives and compliance uh, with regulatory constraints not only mitigate environmental social risks, but also help ships comply with uh, regulatory constraints and contribute uh, to long-term sustainability in the maritime industry. Uh, Theodore, do you share <laughs> this approach? Are they investing so much and on so many <coughs> items? Okay, so there are kind of answers here. It's the general answer and the holy answer. Okay. okay. So uh, I would like to say about the holy answer because that was going to shock you. Because I'm going to give you another aspect of what actual consideration have in mind a tanker operator like me or a tanker owner like someone there. Talking about investments that should be compliant in ESG. Look what happening here, a strange situation. Shipping is an over-regulated industry. We have regulations for this, regulation for that, for ETS, for ballast water, for anything, for ESG now. One of the regulations is the CII rating. How this is going to disaster now, may destroy the ESG strategy? Look what happened here, a secret that nobody knows. CII, what is it? Every vessel, according to how dirty or less clean, let's say, is, is categorized in the E, D, C, D, A category. And most of you will may think that a ship operator like me or a ship owner like you should probably invest in a vessel of categorized B or A, a green eco vessel. But I'm telling you that none of us are thinking like this. Most of us were thinking that to take and purchase and invest in a vessel categorized C. Why is that? Because it's much more easier to stay in that category, hmm? much less expensive to upgrade to B. So if I would like to be a good boy to ESG eyes, if the cost Elena didn't have another malosi, you have to say what I should do. I will purchase in a C category vessel, not in being a, that I should do that. And taking my C vessel to B, I will have a bravo clapping, yeah, and a perfect ESG report, and that should be ESG compliance. What does it mean? That no matter if I am in A category or in D category, I will pay my penalties or the hedging on my emissions, like I said, on my initial speech, anyway. So even if I, I would pay, no matter what, my penalty for emissions, now I'm thinking how I could uh, fool the ESG report. This is an after-goal for the industry. <laughs> because I, everybody is fighting to make a green world, 
putting emissions, it is, uh, and now because of ESG, uh, and because of ESG and CII, most of us investing in vessels, vessels of low CII rating category. This is after gold. So the answer of what investment should become in uh, uh, SIPs in order to be compliance in ESG, mm -hmm. it's unfortunately, except of making, of course, a retrofit, uh, try to make my engines more eco, uh, or whatever, is to try to fool the ESG report. And yes, this is the reality. You're bringing another dimension in the approach uh, under discussion. Um, returning to Ilias, Ilia, do you think that ship owners and seafarers are adequately prepared uh, for uh, strong fleets, which are a component of strong maritime supply chains? Well, um, as we say, the supply chain relies heavily on uh, ship owners and seafarers being adequately prepared to navigate compliance requirements for both current and future uh, developments. Um, ship owners adhere, well, ship owners must ensure that their fleets adhere to international uh, regulations set by the organizations, uh, IMO, and uh, they constantly come up with new regulations and things like that. Um, compliance to safety, of course, uh, and environmental regulations such as MARPO, and crew welfare guidelines. Um, larger shipping companies, um, often have robust compliance uh, departments, uh, but smaller operators um, may face some challenges uh, in keeping up with uh, these uh, regulations. Um, investing in technology, forward-thinking ship owners uh, invest in technologies and innovations uh, that improve efficiencies, uh, the efficiency and reduce emissions uh, and all that, and follow up on their, um, uh, with digital solutions in order to be able to manage their, and uh, the vessels better and more efficiently and also reduce costs. Um, seafarer training and support would be uh, also seafarers are the backbone of the marine industry as we know. Adequate training uh, in safety procedures, environmental practices. And uh, I mean, uh, not, every, not all ship owners and, uh, and stakeholders are in line. So what should, ha what should actually uh, happen is that, uh, as it was said this morning, that there must be a collaboration between all the stakeholders uh, for addressing the common challenges that we have. Yeah, it is often, it is often said that okay. we need synergies between stakeholders. Right. And uh, although many ship owners and seafarers are adequately prepared uh, to contribute to the maritime supply chain, uh, I must say that there is still room for improvement and uh, continued investment in technology, training and sub uh, su sustainability initiatives uh, with the collaboration of the industry engagement will essentially, will be essential for ensuring uh, future uh, uh, the future readiness of the maritime uh, sector. Thank you, Elias. And one of the questions, obviously, is who will train the seafarer of the future uh, if we take into account all these uh, uh, changes underway. Uh, mention was made before, uh, Professor Vangelas, of uh, Piraeus port. Um, I think you had identified uh, a decrease, 15%, if I remember well. Uh, in the traffic, uh, in general, yeah. yeah, and on this point, I would like to ask you, please, uh, the strengths and weaknesses of Greek ports in general, uh, especially from the stance of connectivity and infrastructure in general. Okay, so if we, if we want to talk about the Greek ports, we, we have to, let's say, divide the ports into broad categories. We have tier one ports, which are Piraeus and uh, in, uh, in uh, somehow Thessaloniki, and the second tier, which is all the rest, all the other ports in Greece. So, uh, talking about infrastructures, okay, Piraeus and Thessaloniki are in a better position compared with all the others. 
All the other publishing groups are suffering right now. I mean, they don't have... Uh, suffering. Yeah. They don't have quality infrastructures. They don't have uh, depth. They don't have uh, surface. Uh, they're actually suffering, yeah. Uh, but also, Piraeus and Thessaloniki are facing some difficulties. I mean, Thessaloniki is trying the last 23 years to expand the container terminal. Piraeus right now is uh, in pursuit of uh, developing the fourth care, but even in the case of Piraeus, there's a lack of space, a lack of land, and they are trying to find out a solution with the Greek government. So this is the case of infrastructures, um, and uh, moving on, on to the connectivity issue. Again, here we have to make a distinction. We have the connectivity between the port and the hinterland, uh, in which case all Greek ports are suffering because we don't have an uh, efficient and uh, effective rail network right now and rail services. Okay, connectivity with uh, hinterland requires a very good rail connection. Things are different uh, when we are going to talk about the connectivity in the global shipping networks. Um, Reus especially is one of the most well-connected ports in the global trade networks. According to the World, World Bank uh, Liner Shipping Connectivity Index, uh, Greece is among the top 35 countries in the world in terms of connectivity. We used to be in a place number 95 uh, in the mid of uh, 2000. And uh, this has been happened due to Piraeus because Costco, uh, as a private investor, came at the port, um, developed the port, and of course, uh, the Chinese guys brought several companies and several itineraries at the port of Piraeus. So in terms of connectivity, uh, as regards the, uh, the seafront, we are okay. As regards uh, the um, uh, hidden connectivity, we are suffering. Uh, this brings me um, to the next point, which, about, which is about investments in ports. And I would like to comment uh, with our um, uh, lady uh, who goes to ports and other um, uh, hubs and tries to disseminate information about shipping, the uh, name is Andaku. So, Danai, could you please tell us about investments needed in ports from your perspective uh, as components of strong maritime supply chains? First of all, thank you very much for the invitation, but I would like to say, because I see the title, that's Maritime Supply Chain and Vessel Performance Forum. Unfortunately, maritime supply chain is not connected to shipping. And this is something that shipping has to understand, the ship owners, the ship owning companies have to understand that one cannot work with the other. And until now, they're not connected yet. And uh, because I take the, um, the opportunity to say, that uh, yesterday we had our forum and uh, Agilos Batuvakis, I don't want to say it as I say it, this is why I use the name, is that out of 175 countries that they are in IMO, only three are shipping nations. Out of 195 countries in this world, only 15 control 80% of the worldwide trading. Shipping is polluting the world 2.5%. So why we have to pay everything? Why, who will pay at the end? This is very important. And how many few players are taking the responsibility for all the world? So it's very important to understand when we talk about investments and about what will happen, that 70% of this world is covered by sea. 90% is happening through vessels. And only three players are controlling 45% of the worldwide trading. Japan, China, and Greece. Let's go now to the, to the investments in the ports. We are having a, a, a network of 1,000 uh, tag, tags in 1,400 ports with also agencies, ship agencies. I have sent uh, the question to our agents, and they all reply to me, the Egyptian, the German, the German not so, not so great like us. I mean, Europe is not progressing in development, although we're very innovative region. Unfortunately, we're not so innovative in action. Mm -hmm. Too much analysis brings paralysis in Europe. We overanalyze everything. <laughs> and uh, too much bureaucracy and too many papers. Although the Egyptians or the Singaporeans reply to me of specific investments they are doing. And this is something that uh, and they, uh, they, they, we need to have ports that they have uh, energy, that they can. Uh, and yesterday, because we also had a round table with shipping organizations, 
This is what we have discussed about the Greek ports, because we also spoke about Paris. The Greek ports are suffering seriously in terms of safety and what they can bring as a, as a, as a service to the, to the vessels. So yes, the ports have to be technology advanced. They have to find the energy to give service to the, to the vessels. But most of all, the governments, the, the, entrepreneur, the entrepreneurs and the academia have to understand they have, that they have all to cooperate together around the table. Mm -hmm. This is something that it's not happening. Uh, so this is why I believe that it's, it's, it's very important for uh, uh, and of course, we can have an interactive discussion we with have, not all, <laughs> along yes. the way. Okay. Yes. Yesterday, we had the um, Elime, the, the ports uh, uh, authorization, and of course, the uh, uh, organizations from uh, uh, several ports, and we see the prospect of the investments in our ports, in Volos, in Kavala, in Alexandrupoli, in Thessaloniki, but everybody has independent agenda, not all together to mapping the real needs. Uh, this is a very important topic, and um, with so many things happening, electrification and new needs connected with de decarbonization, etc. It and is also key. in the ports, apologies for interrupting you, they also have the same questions like the ship owners. In which energy should we invest? Mm -hmm. So How we can do it better. It is a necessity, and I have to tell you that I'm deeply, I feel a lot of uh, uh, respect for this uh, discussion about ports because we are next to Zea, one of the oldest uh, ports uh, worldwide. Uh, Themistocles uh, used to send uh, the frigates from uh, there to the war, and uh, Zea to Dimitriako was transported uh, from that port. Uh, we have a heavy tradition, and we have to grasp the challenge for the future. Uh, Theodore, where do ports need to invest, uh, in your opinion? Okay, for one more time, there are two uh, kind of answers. It's a general answer and the holy answer. General answer will totally agree with the nine. One of the main things that should be uh, maintained in a port is to be a source of energy and mostly uh, to make infrastructure for the alternative fuels. We're talking all those months now that in order to fight the emissions uh, problem, we must uh, be ready to load uh, and burn alternative fuels. Where are the alternative fuels? Nowhere. If there are alternative fuels, aviation took the major part, and whatever missing for the uh, shipping should be somewhere. So ports should make enough infrastructure in order to give the chance for bunkering in alternative fuels. Also the electricity. Uh, in June, when we had the chance to uh, have an, uh, in Thessaloniki uh, the Mara port, uh, we find out that uh, one uh, cruise line, a cruise boat, uh, Giorgio Vagelas, uh, if stays, for example, for five hours uh, in port, it's extremely huge electricity power, and this power is not available in the ports. So this is the regular questions. But now there's also the Huli answer. Huli answer will shock you again with something that I have on mind. For me as a tanker operator, one of the main problem is the congestion. Mm -hmm. Some years ago, congestion is, well, not so many. So, such a big problem. Okay, I will stay, delay, wait, be paid. But now there is something that nobody could imagine. And what is this? Is that a ship that chooses a port where delays are observed due to congestion, get 
a CII rating worst. That means that I will start making selection and say, no, I will not go to that port. If I, me, as a ship operator, start saying I will not go to that port because that will get my CII worst, so my ESG will be worse, so the, the Poseidon principles will not give me money and all those problems, and if I say I will not go to that port, so that country and that port will miss products. And if they miss products, they will come back to me and tell the Theodore, please, come, I will pay the, 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 your penalties. And if they pay the penalties, that cost will be added to the products. Right. So that means inflation, that means recession, that means disaster. So for me, the main infrastructure that should be made is that the ports must maintain the infrastructures and not having this conjecture, because now we care about that. Because now to delay means cost that reducing my CII rating and put me in a worst position. And in case I will prepare, I will prefer to say I will not go to that port, and that have never done before in the past. This is a problem. Uh, you have clearly pointed to the magic of maritime supply chains. Everything is connected. Of course. So, uh, Professor Vangelas, what investments are needed by ports okay. to grasp uh, All right. challenge? Are we talking in general or for the Greek ports? I would rather say Greek ports. All right. So, we need uh, in, several, in, in several ports, I mean, we need capacity. Uh, Piraeus right now is facing congestion problems, although few months uh, in the year, but congestion is here. So they are seeking to expand the container terminal with a fourth gear. The Saloniki is trying to do the same. I mean, so we need money to expand our docks. We need also money, um, I mean, investments of money, okay, uh, to um, make ports greener. I mean, we have the green deal right now. By 2050, we have to uh, be a, a decarbonized industry. And the, right now, the Greek ports lacking behind. I mean, uh, I have been in several ports around the world, they are producing clean energy. Uh, we don't have any example here in Greece, apart from Piraeus, who has some uh, photovoltaic panels in the port. All the other energy is dirty energy, it's not a clean one. Also, they have to invest in uh, the so-called digitalization, okay? And let's talk about the port community system. We are among the very few ports around the world, I mean, the big ports, that they don't operate a port community system. The single window is coming, as you said. Okay, we have also to invest in this. Uh, you can ask the Greek ports about cybersecurity, what they are doing about it. And of course, we are also need to invest on uh, connectivity, on hydrogen connectivity. Uh, the majority of the Greek ports are lacking uh, rail. I think Volos, they don't have a rail access. Of course, it's only something <coughs> Piraeus. So we, we have a lot of things to do. Mm -hmm. What is the problem? We don't have the, the, the necessary capital. Okay, that's it. I, have, I want to be fair. What are the strengths, however, of Greek ports? Right. Ah, okay. yeah, there must be some. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course there are. Uh, geographical position, first of all. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I mean, Piraeus right now is a major hub. Let's assume that the Red Sea crisis will pass over in, uh, in the next few months. Piraeus is a major port. Uh, and also, the, we have, uh, let's say, what we call it, Potentials. I mean, they have potentials. Uh, Volos, for example, because we have the, the president here. Kavala, Iraq, right now, they are discussing of making a hub for importing Chinese electrical vehicles there. Volos, there was an interest for other, from other car, uh, uh, for car manufacturers to bring car, to develop a car terminal in Volos. Um, we also have to look the, the wider perspective, what's going on in our neighborhood. Uh, Ukraine is trying to uh, export the, their grain through the port of Alexandropolis. So we have opportunities. We have strengths. We have uh, okay, a very good geographical position. And of course, um, adequate infrastructures in some ports, for example, Piraeus. But of course, as I said before, we need more investments. We need mm -hmm. money in order to exploit these potentials. So thank you. These are the risks related to investments. Uh, Theodore uh, Julieras, what are the risks uh, stemming from uh, the climate parameter uh, which impacts uh, on uh, maritime supply chains? 
Of course. You are involved with the trading of emissions, so I think yeah. you are well in a position to address this. Uh, Climate related risks, yes, of course there are, there are many. Most simple, uh, the weather risks. Uh, bad weather make uh, confuse uh, the supply chain because uh, ships uh, will delay or uh, will be una uh, unable to, to proceed. So weather is mm -hmm. something that uh, has to do with the climate exchange and affecting uh, the supply chain. Number two, uh, the rising sea levels, up or down, something new. Look what happened in Panama. Absolutely. Look what happened in Panama. We cannot uh, pass <coughs> the number of vessels that, uh, that we was passing uh, years ago because of the rising or falling of the, of, the, of, the, of the sea. That's something that has to do with climate related risk and exist. And of course, number three, uh, the emissions. The emissions add a huge cost to all the shipping companies due to uh, ETS, uh, the emission trading system. This is also something that uh, happening because of the climate exchange. I am not agree that this is the solution. It's just a way to collect money for uh, R&D. Okay, let's do it, but it, 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 it's totally different. Every vessel to have more than five million dollars per year, additional cost uh, to the voyage of calculations. This is subject to the climate-related risk. So yes, there are, there is climate-related risk. Three of them I have already mentioned. A lot of others after the lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Dr. Maria Provulaki, Danai and Elias. Concerning the human element, human element is a strong component of strong maritime supply chains. What have we learned after the pandemic and all the um, uh, circumstances uh, that we have been experience, uh, experiencing in recent years? Maria? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's one of the greatest resilience exercises that uh, was successful. Uh, seafarers and shipping companies managed to deliver. Uh, we continued consuming from home. Um, and uh, I will go back to what the nine mentioned, uh, this independent thinking, this silo thinking of governments uh, was revealed. And uh, so some succeeded, some did not under this, uh, this crisis, which is not a single crisis, it's a tsunami. Uh, earlier, uh, George uh, mentioned the three, four crises one year after the year. And uh, uh, having the luxury to observe <laughs> from, from home, uh, I can say that as um, seafarers delivered on board those who stayed, um, uh, th there was a, l a lot of discussion about the well-being. Uh, it was a paper exercise uh, for, for us observing. We, we went there, uh, but these people uh, stayed, and shipping companies, the shore-based personnel, also managed to hold. Uh, we have seen changes in the operational practices, and uh, if I am to keep something for the future, is this uh, altered, remote, uh, management and operational practices, and uh, both the shore-based personnel and the seagoing continued uh, embraced it. Uh, from the side of the international organizations, I think they uh, did not stand uh, as, uh, as it was expected, and this is something that we need to change, uh, start doing contingency uh, plans for the next crisis, be prepared, and uh, the, the, for me, there is no excuse huh? after that. And uh, one more thing to, uh, to retain, and um, this well-being is not uh, something that uh, sounds uh, you know, fancy and uh, it's the talk of the town. Uh, I would also shed light to the seafarers who were not on board, but were actually uh, ashore, waiting, unemployed, more than a year, 
having to feed their families. And this is a reason that we have a huge leak that the numbers, the statistics, do not show yet. Because they had to feed their families and they switched from the profession, even from the industry. Uh, so when it's time to talk about labor shortages, the numbers are not reflecting the real situation. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, I understand that you have implied the delay of the international community in qualifying seafarers as key workers. A, a safe. Uh, and um, I also understand that um, you have implied the fact that we don't have a very exciting narrative to share with younger generations concerning the profession because of uh, all these difficulties that, uh, the, uh, interna that international shipping has been experiencing. Uh, then I, uh, you interact a lot with uh, uh, shipping community, including uh, younger generations, and I would like to ask your views about this uh, uh, point, please. The very important. Uh, I agree with what Maria said and what mm -hmm. you said. Uh, while the seafarers were moving the world, because my family were also owners of a medium to big hotel for Greece, 53 rooms in Zakynthos, but we were never believing that we will be 98% empty <laughs> because of the that the the airplanes were not uh, flying. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could. Uh, we have done plans for earthquake in Zakynthos, you know, we're moving a lot in this island, <laughs> which is okay, good. Of some local crisis in uh, Greece, but never because of the airplanes not traveling. <laughs> the vessels were keep moving while the international organizations, I don't want to name them because I will be, I, I will be criticized, they, were, they could not meet even online. And these people were fighting by uh, 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 having longer contracts. Instead of three months, many of them stayed 10 and 12 months in order to have the right thing on, in pharmacies and supermarkets and make the world go round. And this is very, very, it's a shame for all of us that still we're not considering them critical uh, uh, um, workers from all over the world. When I go to the schools, the, when I say, I say to them that the only reason that I'm telling you to go to shipping, to the blue economy, is that two sectors did not stop even for a day, the technology and shipping. So I'm telling to the young people that at least you, if you are studying something around shipping or if you go to work into shipping, you will always have a job to do. And this is very important. The lessons learned is that we have to uh, uh, create practices and policies for the mental health, the well-being. These people are changing every three months uh, uh, um, the nature of work for us, for me, that I'm going to the same office for 23 years. I mean, I'm hearing young people and older people saying, being miserable about their lives and how how boring is the office or how tough it is to work. And they don't think that how tougher is mm -hmm. the CIFAR. Uh, so it's very, very important to uh, uh, take uh, um, um, lessons from them and create a new world by bringing into the table the CIFARs to tell us how to adapt to crisis. Human-centered uh, industry, and in an attempt to be fair towards all stakeholders, let me point to industry best practice, which was developed following uh, health crisis, like for example, IMO, uh, safe uh, crew changes uh, protocol. It is a 60-page uh, resource, which supports safe uh, changes. Uh, and can be used uh, in general uh, if you have an emergency of uh, health interest. But uh, we all agree that there is room for more Presently, action. Just listen, to yes. we have 74,000 vessels and around 1.9 million seafarers. In around 20 to 30 years, we will be having 150,000 vessels and around 4 million seafarers. We're 8 billion and we will be 10 billion. And we're still talking a lot about artificial intelligence and we don't talk about physical intelligence. These people have to work. We cannot create technology for 
having people staying aside. We have to see the human element in cooperation with the technology. Uh, Sorry for being so passionate, but really, is, uh, hear, uh, to hear programs <laughs> in Germany and the USA that they pay the people to stay in their houses, what world are we living in? And as English judges say in English uh, court rulings, uh, they, re re they uh, rely upon common sense. Yes, common mm -hmm. sense. I mean, artificial intelligence, uh, data analytics, um, Internet of Things are fantastic things. Nevertheless, we need to function also as uh, humans, uh, using our uh, judgment, etc. Uh, a few words from you, Elias, before we attack the last two questions and uh, bring the session to completion about lessons learned and the human element. Um, I think that um, lessons learned, uh, for example, I mean, from the pandemic uh, were the necessity to implement uh, stricter health and safety protocols on board the vessels uh, to prevent the spread of the virus. Uh, these measures included quarantine periods, regular testing, and enhancing uh, sanitation practices, adhering to protocols uh, as well. This was something that uh, uh, the, the pandemic, let's say, helped um, enhance certain um, uh, protocols that were not in place or whatever. Okay, um, also uh, it enhanced uh, the adoption of digital technologies and remote monitoring solutions in the maritime uh, industry so that um, for virtual, example, virtual training programs, digital documentation systems, uh, embracing generally the operation efficiency of, uh, in order to be able to face the future and uh, such uh, let's say, uh, I, would not, I, I hope not another pandemic, but any other type of uh, critical um, situations that we may mm -hmm. face. Um, basically, the, I believe it's uh, the pandemic really um, uh, highlighted the indispensable role of the human element in ensuring uh, the resilience and sustainability of. Uh, of the maritime industry and the maritime supply chain, uh, okay, and uh, and I think it's about time, like prioritizing crew welfare, implementing health and safety protocols, and uh, digitalization uh, is something that uh, has to be enhanced. Absolutely, as I like to say, a safe ship is a happy ship, and you cannot have a safety embedded uh, in a crew that is not. Uh, enjoying uh, decent working and living conditions aboard. Um, Maria, tell us about uh, labor shortfalls and how they impact, please, on maritime supply chains. Well, if we talk about the, sea f the seafarers... Yes, we... Six. As I said, the uh, shortage is still not reflected in statistics. Mm -hmm. uh, it is shortage in terms of quantity and quality in specific ranks, specific skills. Um, the fleet is growing, so we can, uh, from now, uh, see and project the shortages and the, and the problems that will arise pretty soon. Uh, when I talk about the shortage, people uh, sometimes say we will have unmanned vessels. Unmanned vessels are not people free. Uh, in order to navigate these uh, remotely, you need even more specialized and uh, qualified labor, and where is the training for this kind of personnel, for, for this kind of labor? We miss that. I think technology is uh, moving very fast. There is a slow pace from the side of the uh, education and training. Um, and I would also like to emphasize the transition era, uh, which should not leave behind those that already hold experience it is one of the most traditional industries and will, uh, although technologically advanced and changed, will still remain uh, very, very traditional in, uh, in its base. Huh? So uh, the people who already hold the experience should be upskilled in order to go hand in hand with the next generation. We need labor uh, of all generations. And uh, going back to the seagoing personnel, uh, if, if ship 
owners or uh, shipping uh, companies have not already invested in the emerging labor supplying countries, do it immediately, uh, starting from scratch to build the people of the uh, next generation. For the uh, shore staff, uh, we do see, um, I mean, we're talking about fuels, uh, who is going to design these vessels? We lack naval architects, we lack engineers, economists who can understand the whole chain. We've been talking about the, about the ports, but what about the land-based facilities? Mm -hmm. hmm? And funds and important. safety mm -hmm. that connects the maritime labor supply uh, chain with the land-based, whether it's train or trucks. We see a great difference in the standards. Huh? So um, it's a long discussion. Uh, but uh, for sure, I uh, sure that uh, in terms of quantities is a difficult equation. Huh? And from uh, labor uh, shortfalls uh, from ships to ports, do you also see Maria issues concerning shortfalls affecting uh, labor in ports? Uh, absolutely. From, from strength mm -hmm. to skills, I use the expression of uh, George in one of his uh, academic articles. This is where we're going. Uh, for sure, port workers, in the past we used the term stevedores, it's not a strength anymore. Port workers, we need more skilled. Uh, in terms of hard skills, for sure, all this equipment and technology that is to be used, but also the soft skills in terms of communication, coordination of the different uh, entities involved. And I will also emphasize uh, safety awareness, situational understanding, situational awareness at the individual and the team level. This is the great uh, deal, uh, I would say. Vanai, do you agree with this approach concerning port labor and uh, issues uh, stemming from uh, digitalization, automization? Of course, we agree more or less we say the same. We, we need uh, the governments. Look, the ports are being run in most of the cases mm -hmm. by the governments. And unfortunately, the governments are changing very often. And the people who are in the ministries, one day they are in health, next they are in shipping, then they go to tourism. They are not concentrated into the same uh, so sector totally. long term. Right. So what we have to do from our side, some of us have to be non-profit advisors long term. And I know that in Greece, when we talk about non-profit or volunteerism, everybody says, why to do it? This is my job. No, but in order to create the ecosystem, you have to do it. And the entrepreneurs have to be entrepreneurs and not politicians. Because we see many cases that the entrepreneurs are running into politics in order to make it happen. So we need to cooperate with this. We need to create the political entrepreneurs I, I insist very much on this, and this is what I believe it's very important. As a young global leader in the World Economic Forum, we are seeing this. There is no reason to do it, but the very important thing is the schools. The schools. In, in the biggest shipping nation in the world, we go to the schools and we ask them what is Naftilia, and they tell me if it has to do with Naftia. Of course, Greeks do not know what is Naftilia. On the 9th of May, yes, yes. we issue the first book guide for shipping in Greece and maybe in the world for shipping. When you go to the bookstores, you cannot find a guide to show to your kid what blue economy and shipping is. Oh. And we have 3,000 history, 3,000 years history. So we said we are next to the oldest port. We are, but we don't do anything about this. The history is back. We cannot always say how good we were in the past. We have also to create the future. Absolutely. And that so is why... We have to work with the young people mm -hmm. all over the world. The peop they are working and we're finishing. And I know people are working for the, to the kids until the age of seven. The people are, are creating their character mm -hmm. until the age of seven. And here in Greece, we remember to give attention to our kids when they are 16, 17. It's too late. So we have to work with the schools. Thank you, Danai. Thank and you, too. Uh, a few words from Professor Vajelas, very quickly, please, about port uh, uh, labor uh, affected by mm -hmm. what is happening or... Okay, three, three words. Just three words. That would be great because we Maria are running out of time. Said. 
we are heading towards more skilled personnel instead of uh, uh, unskilled personnel. We need smartness instead of strength. One second one is the certification. We need uh, a European level approach regarding uh, the certification of uh, uh, port labor. If you are a crane operator in Greece, you cannot work in a, in a port on the same crane in a port in uh, Belgium. And third, gender equality. Uh, because, okay, automation makes more room, I mean, and it creates opportunities for women to enter, <coughs> or, I shall say, to, uh, to, to expand the presence of women in the port industry. I was in, in a port last year, and there was a breast, uh, it was a fully automated port. Uh, in the control room of the port, nine out of ten uh, people were women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're in the Gandu Grains, that's right. Thank you so much. And if I had to sum up uh, uh, this uh, meaningful discussion in a few words, I would use the words synergies and awareness. My thanks uh, to each and every one of you. Thank you also, Adonis Violaris, for the fantastic gesture at the beginning of the panel, panel and also for orchestrating uh, everything. And. Uh, it's time to uh, give uh, the lead to uh, the steering committee for next stage. So are we having a ceremony for? Yes, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good, Arto. Bravo. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.